Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we have a very, very incredible space lined up for today. Uh, we had a few delays uh, getting everything started, but really appreciate your patience. Thank you so much for waiting. Um, we're going to spend the next hour or so uh, with Dr. Gavin Wood and some of the parody team here that are up on the uh, virtual stage with me. Uh, we're going to dive into Jam, uh, which we believe will be one of the next big disruptors in Web3. Uh, so I am Birdo. I'm working at Parity. Um, Parity, if you didn't know, is one of the core contributors to the Polkadot ecosystem, and I'll be your host for the day. Uh, we are going to cover some of the basics of Jam, the, I guess, like vision for Polkadot and discuss some of the changes that we may see in the future um, and also talk about some of the tech that Jam will bring in the future as well. Uh, we will run for about an hour or so with a little bit of Q&A time at the end. Um, and if you can, take a minute to like the space, drop some love hearts in the bottom. Uh, if you would like to write in a question uh, to Gavin or the team, um, there's a blue icon. Maybe it's changed on the UI for me. Anyway, uh, maybe there's a little plus icon you can use at the bottom to send a, um, send a message, basically reply to the space. Um, and we'll look through those questions for a bit of Q&A at the end. Um, and if you can bookmark or retweet or reshare the, the space, anything like that helps engagement um, and helps uh, expand the audience, which would be very useful. Uh, so let's do a quick round of intros. Maybe uh, we can start with Pierre as the newest member uh, to Parity. If you could give us a quick introduction, uh, tell us what you do at Parity, and also we'd love to hear your favorite jam flavor. Oh, so I am Pierre. I am managing like most of the engineers at Parity, and I am currently taking care of like Polkadot One, Polkadot Two, and my favorite jam is strawberry. Nice and uh, Bestie. Hey, yeah, I'm Bestie. I'm working at Parity or at Polkadot since 2018. Um, yeah, good cumulus. Uh, and my favorite jam is also strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. Um, and Gavin, uh, I'm not too sure if you, you need an introduction here, but maybe you could give a, a quick kind of recap um, of your like history in blockchain to date, just for anyone that's maybe new listening in. Sorry, uh, uh, oh. Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, Gav, if you want to give a quick, like, introduction of uh, some of your kind of, I guess, like, work in the blockchain or Web3 space to, to date for anyone kind of new listening in would be useful. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, well, I kicked off in uh, uh, December 2013 uh, implementing the uh, uh, Ethereum. <laughs> and helping uh, helping sort of turn the white paper into uh, uh, you know the final design, uh, which was uh, uh, penned with the yellow paper. That was, uh, that was sort of the first uh, um, first of my papers. Um, uh, after that, I uh, I sort of went on uh, to found Parity, and we we made a. A second implementation of Ethereum that at the time was actually called Parity. Parity was called Ethcore. Um, and then after that, uh, I uh, I went on to write the Polkadot paper, uh, which was uh, you know basically what 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 has since become Polkadot. Uh, pretty much the first uh, uh, scalable um, like sharded uh, blockchain architecture. And then after that, it was the fellowship. So I wrote the fellowship paper. Um, and this is like, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what DAOs are. Uh, I don't have a comprehensive list of DAOs out there, but I have heard it banded around that polka dot with the, with, you know, with the fellowship and the, 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 the uh, governance um, is uh, the largest uh, DAO, at least in terms of uh, uh, cash that it has on hand. Um, and then now, uh, yeah, now it's uh, uh, Jam and the uh, the grey paper, which describes um, the Jam protocol. Nice, thank you. Um, and so maybe we can start with kind of a quick introduction, uh, like around Polkadot and what it is again for anyone that may be new, uh, new joining in and kind of listening for the first time. 
maybe uh, like Gavin, if you wanted to kind of give a quick summary of kind of like what you think Polkadot is and like what it allows builders to do. Uh, certainly, yeah. So, I mean, this is a, a very interesting question. Polkadot, as it stands today, is largely an implementation of what was presented in the Polkadot paper back in late 2016, uh, which is a scalable, heterogeneous multi-chain. Um, what this means is that it's a, uh, uh, a bunch of chains uh, that are uh, sort of glued together um, through a common consensus protocol, uh, and these chains can uh, 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 can interact, interoperate um, without fear that uh, 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 one of them can go awry and cause problems on the others in quite the same way that you would get if they were all under separate uh, consensus systems. Um, now, the idea was to create, uh, you know, was was actually the basic idea of Polkadot was 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 that. It, uh, was built on an assumption that was never really properly vocalized, uh, which is that this multi-chain architecture was just the natural next step in the evolution of, of blockchain. You know, it's like, well, we've got one blockchain and it's, it's, it's you know, uh, sort of like Bitcoin and it does a particular job. And then we say, well, there was an Ethereum and it was, now it can do lots of different jobs uh, owing to this uh, uh, sort of Turing complete um, uh, EVM, Ethereum virtual machine that it's built upon. And then Polkadot comes along and it's like, right, this is many different um, sort of uh, uh, blockchains, um, each uh, in principle uh, running on the same VM. In our case, it was WebAssembly, um, but uh, uh, sort of uh, able to handle, one would expect, a particular task um, uh, more uh, um, uh, more effectively perhaps than others and so you start seeing you know app chains uh, pop up domain specific chains and as i say this was just a general assumption that uh, that it would be the next logical step sharding um, now in reality i think over the last five years what we've learned is that it's not necessarily uh, the next logical that that specific architecture is not necessarily the next logical step and that's what jam is here to um, uh, to address but in principle what polka dot is was was always sort of meant to be as it were is um you know a big uh, hefty scalable computation um engine that works in consensus that is secure that is resilient that can process an awful lot of transactions okay great and uh, like pierre or bessie not sure who wants to chime in but it would be interesting to kind of hear from your point of view what uh, you feel like Polkadot allows builders to kind of do or achieve with the technology that it provides? I, I can see me and maybe give a different angle. Like, I think Polkadot is a major platform. Like, it's a place where you can find like all the functionalities you want and they're already there. Like, you don't, don't need to code that much. And on top of that, like, the the complex part, like the part which is how to secure all these things has been done like very thoroughly. So sometimes people have been complaining that it increased complexity, but at the same time it gives peace of mind uh, because you know that like the relay chain you are like depending on is like well designed and there has been no shortcut in how it is implemented. And that's the same thing, for example, with the bridges, which are complex components coming in Polkadot Narrow that have been like well designed and they are much more like robust and secure because of that. Back to you, Bardo. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like it sounds like uh, Polkadot kind of bootstraps the security and allows people to kind of uh, build basically anything on top, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and I was wondering then maybe how you could kind of uh, you you could kind of see Jam fitting into the future vision of Polkadot. Um, would be super interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, as I was sort of saying, the the original um, largely unstated goal of Polkadot was really to be this, uh, you know, very uh, scalable um, shared computer. Now, the fact that it uh, took the shape of a quote-unquote scalable heterogeneous multi-chain, bit of a mouthful, that one, but it's, it, it, you know, it describes quite 
uh, succinctly what it was that we were trying to deliver um, back in you know, 2016, 17, 18, um, is, uh, you know, sort of the fact that it took that shape um, wasn't, uh, that was our best guess, or certainly my best guess for what shape it should take in order to deliver this scalable big compute resource. Um, broadly speaking, when I say this scalable, big, resilient compute resource, what I'm talking about is a blockchain that delivers lots of block space, right? That's, if we're going to sort of cut to the chase, um, block space is this, this term um, that sort of become, uh, that sort of come up over the last few years, uh, describing um, computation that is done without the need to trust someone. Um, and then we can measure the quality of block space, like how, uh, just how much don't we need to trust someone? Just what different things can this block space be used for? Um, and so forth. And we can also dis uh, describe how much block space there is, largely in terms of uh, maximum throughput and cost. Now, the idea is to basically have nice big numbers for those. And that's really what Polkadot, although we never, the term hadn't come about when Polkadot, the Polkadot paper was written. Um, but that's really what we were aiming for with Polkadot. Now, it turns out <laughs> that um, having lots and lo lots of blockchains um, and them each being secured under the same umbrella, under the same consensus uh, uh, mechanism, um, isn't necessarily the best way to go in order to deliver high quality block space. Um, this is this is now uh, having built it. This is now um, a, a reflection on that. And the 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 reason that I say this is uh, is very simple. Um, it's called um, a state um, a partitioning or state segmentation or state fragmentation. Now, state is this basically the stuff that's left over after you've done lots of all, all of your transactions, all of your computation. You end up with this, you take some state to begin with and you end up with some state afterwards. You can think of it as like your account balance or uh, what NFTs you happen to hold or, um, you know, the, the current status of your insurance contract or whatever else. It's the stuff that's left over after the transaction is finished um, that can be uh, uh, drawn up again when, a, when a, no, a new transaction is going to begin. Now, having lots of uh, having lots of state is very important for a blockchain um, to work properly. Basically, if you have a limited amount of state, state uh, sorry, states, then you can only process um, so many or only um, uh, uh, hold so many user accounts. You can only hold so many insurance contracts, only hold so many account balances, and so forth. So you want lots of state. You also want lots of transactions, but that's a separate thing. Now. State fragmentation is basically what is forced on you if you uh, if you adhere to the uh, to the sort of general polka dot uh, design. Now, this is not this is not purely polka dot. A few other systems have done this. Uh, basically, if you see systems that have many different blockchains and scale through sort of spinning up more blockchains, this is this is sort of what's going on there. Um, and what it does is it says, well, some bits of the state can interact. Um, uh, fundamentally and persistently, um, more cheaply, more more speedily than other bits than of the state. So basically, what we're doing is we're taking the state, which can be a huge, huge amount of data, and partitioning it up, and saying basically it's fine as long as you're uh, you're working within your partition. But if you ever want to work across partitions then it's going to get slow, it's going to get expensive, and it's going to get a pain. And if, if it just so happens um, that all of the state that you need for the stuff you want to do doesn't fit into one partition, um, then you're kind of screwed. You kind of have to come up with very clever ways um, and, uh, of like part partitioning anyway and then sucking up the costs. And what we see with this partitioning is, um, is that when you go across the partitions, you have to use special language, uh, special languages to do it, special programming techniques. Um, for example, in Polkadot, it's XCM. Um, you have to use sort of asynchronous programming techniques. And basically everything becomes quite a lot harder to do than if it's in the same partition. What Jam brings is the ability to not have to have persistent partitioning. Now, we still need to uh, parallelize. We're still going to scale out, 
right? So what that means is that we're still going to have to divide and conquer. We're going to have to divide up our workload into different partitions and process it. But what, what Jam provides is an ability to not have to have those partitions be persistent. Um, we only partition um, for, a, for an instant of time before basically everything goes back into the big, big lake of state um, and things can be repartitioned in some different way the next uh, the next point in time and this is a step change um, in blockchain design and it's a, it's in particular um, it facilitates a number of uh, of, of paradigms um, that we wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to achieve if we just do this persistent fragmentation uh, okay that's that's super interesting um, and Uh, I guess, like, um, <laughs> I'm trying to try to think of the next thing to say. Um, I, I guess then, like, if you um, if you were to kind of like uh, explain that in like one or two sentences, uh, how would you kind of go about doing that? Like the 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 advancements that Jam brings with you know like um, uh, with this like persistent petition or not persistent petition. Um. It's a little bit like, let's, let's have a think. It's a little bit like, suppose you have a, a workforce. Now, you might have a thousand people in the workforce. You could divide those thousand people in the workforce up into a thousand companies. Each company handles, I don't know, some particular uh, contracts with another company or whatever. But, the, you know, you've got these company walls, and it means that if you're an employee of the company, you're going to stay an employee of the company. All of the information regarding that company is going to reside sort of just with you, not with anyone else, right? Now, that's not how um, a large company works, right? They can't, a large company doesn't just subcontract out to a thousand smaller companies. No. Instead, they actually hire a thousand people and have them all sort of work together. Um, splitting up the, uh, the, the the job, uh, the work that they need to do um, as 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 needed, yeah, as uh, in, in an efficient way. And if they do it efficiently, then they're going to be able to accomplish an awful lot more than one thousand um, uh, 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 one person companies, each with their you know very high um, cost for uh, interaction with each other uh, would be able to do. And Jam is is basically facilitating this one thousand person single company rather than uh, what we have at the moment, which is sort of a, a thousand one person companies. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so it sounds like it would bring uh, like greater efficiencies and uh, I guess new use cases or new opportunities to the to the blockchain space, right? Yeah, I mean, um, if you if you think about it, it's like suppose these are construction companies. You know, there's a there's a limited amount that you can do with a one thousand one person construction companies, right? Um, compared to one one thousand person construction company, like you can build a skyscraper with a one thousand person construction company. You can't build a skyscraper. You, you know, it'd be a lot more difficult to build a skyscraper if you had to somehow partition up the building <laughs> of a skyscraper into 1,000 separate work contracts for the 1,000 companies to sort of be paid and go away and do individually. Probably, that would be really hard, right? Probably need uh, like a 1,000 project managers as well, right? 1,000 project managers for the 1,000 engineers. <laughs> that's, that's it. So uh, indeed, every company brings its, its, its interaction costs, and they are generally... Um, you know, they're, they're generally a fixed, a fixed cost. Like indeed you need a program project manager. You need, probably need some sort of payroll manager. You probably need some sort of, you know, uh, a lawyer or legal, uh, and finance person and so forth and so on. So it's like, it, it really can help a lot if you can, um, basically bring all of these resources, uh, under the same roof, even though they are, they are, they are people. It's not that you've got one person that, operates a thousand times as fast as a, as a regular person, right? You still have to divide and conquer, but you can do so without so many of the interaction costs that you would normally get if each person sits in their own company. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Ho hopefully that makes, uh, makes sense to people uh, in the audience. Best of your thoughts? Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I wanted to compare it a little bit to like a, 
real example from now, uh, like from today or whatever, which you could take. So, for example, like in Ethereum or whatever, you have like uh, these flash loans, and so you, you so you get like get a loan over some kind uh, like some some amount of money, and then like do crazy shit with it, whatever, like call different kinds of contracts and do arbitrage and and whatever. And <clears throat> so that's like a, that's I mean it's possible in 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 Ethereum or currently because like as Gav already explained. All the states sit together, so like you can like access all the data. Uh, but in in Polkadot, currently you cannot do like you, you cannot go to Hydra and directly call something on a Kala and then go somewhere else. Like do multiple hops if you want to do that. You you need to have like a XEM and that makes it like uh, asynchronous and then it's slower as like if you do it like synchronous. And with with Gem, we we get this opportunity that we have like we have these separate like blockchains or whatever in the future, which are like specialized for certain things and but they can actually like synchronously interact with each other. So like we can actually have like a flash loan across like different parachains, for example, that does like, yeah. I mean, I think last bull run, you, 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 there was like in, in ECs, I think one guy that had like a real big flash loan, which made a lot of money with, I don't know how, how it was, but uh, something like that. Makes sense. And, and so, I mean, I guess this is getting a little bit more technical, but I can imagine there would be like different MEV opportunities and, and different things like that, which haven't happened so much in, in Polkadot to date, right? We'll see more interesting things like that be able to happen with this. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, the, whole, the whole task of sequencing is not something that Jam does directly. Um, I mean, it's not something that Jam does at all. Uh, that's that's left for um, something above on, on the layer above. It might possibly form an element, of, a part of Jam in the future, um, in some like Jam version two. Uh, but at least for what's um, what's currently under uh, 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 um, formalization at the moment, uh, it won't be um, it won't be a part of it. But indeed, um, sequencing will always come in somewhere and. Um, and where it does, uh, and how it's designed, will impact on what MEV opportunities there might be. Yeah, nice. Okay. And so, for people that are starting to kind of read through the grey paper or look at Jam in a little bit more detail, uh, there's been some. Well, there's there's kind of talk of this like a new relay chain or new Jam chain. Um, that sounds like it's going to be a pretty big change, and would be interesting to kind of hear um, what that means for like the current Polkadot ecosystem. Uh, so, like, what that means for parachain teams and kind of people that are currently building now. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a it's a fairly big change from the point of view of of the core developers. Um, it's actually a pretty big change a uh, change from the point of view of, of Polkadot per se, like the Polkadot um, uh, community, the Polkadot network um, of individuals. Largely because we are moving, we're transitioning from being implementation driven to um, uh, specification uh, driven, um, and this is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's. I think it's a, a very important change. I think it's very, uh, a very good change. Um, the um, jam is uh, designed to be a drop-in replacement for the relay chain. Um, much of the underlying apparatus of the jam chain is unchanged um, from what's already been developed for the relay chain. Um, stuff like the availability system, uh, how um, how parachains uh, are progressed, um, validating uh, parachain blocks. Um, the, these things remain largely unchanged. Um, the point of Jam is to open up new possibilities with other things that can be deployed on the same machinery, the same apparatus. As Pierre mentioned earlier, this this technology is mature. It's been running, um, you know, a multi-billion dollar network for, you know, in the wild for, I don't know how many years, now, three, four. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and it, 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 the tires have been kicked. It, it's pretty solid, you know, touch wood. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and so it doesn't make sense to, to, to change much of this. But what we want to do is to um, open it for um, new usage paradigms, for more powerful usage paradigms, um, like synchronous composability that Basti was mentioning earlier. Um, 
Now, from the point of view of parachain teams, um, quote unquote, not much should change, right? N ideally, nothing. Um, I, the, the target is that um, any chain that, that utilizes Cumulus now will be basically recompilable um, with some new version of Cumulus yet to be released, and it will just work, <laughs> quote unquote, with, uh, with Jam, right? Um, Jam will host a, 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 a service so on Jam. These kind of smart contract-esque things are called services. Um, you can think of a service as like a sort of very scalable, very powerful smart contract. It's a, it's a you know, piece of software that sits on chain um, that, that is permissionless. And one of these services, um, a special one that will be there when, when Jam launches, um, will be the, uh, the, the sort of parachains service. And what that will do is it will largely replicate the functionality of Polkadot as, it's, as it is today. And Cumulus will be able to target this. Uh, and and the, the, from the parachain's point of view, it, it will just continue going. Like, you know, it, it, finality will, will, um, will, will pause as, uh, as the relay chain mo uh, is, is decommissioned, or the jam chain is commissioned. But once that decommission, recommission, uh, decommissioning, commissioning um, is sort of a bit like a power cycle, once that happens, and, you know, hopefully this is, this is something that is maybe minutes if uh, maybe maybe an hour or two uh, but not not very long in, in the grand scheme of things um, once that sort of power cycle happens um, the parachains uh, will start finalizing again but they'll finalize now with the jam chain rather than the relay chain um, and indeed it's not another relay chain it's a different kind of chain <laughs> so whereas at the moment we have the polka dot relay chain um, in the future, the idea is we will have the Polkadot Jam Chain. Um, and the Jam Chain will do everything that the Polkadot Relay Chain today does, uh, but it will do, uh, will, will, will be able to do um, quite a lot more as well. Okay. And do you think, uh, like, some of the existing parachains will get access to this, like, synchronous composability? Or is that something that needs to happen elsewhere, like on a different service or in some other method? Uh, sorry, you dropped out a little bit there. Oh, uh, sorry. Could you sure, I was just saying, uh, do you think that the current parachains will then have access to like the synchronous composability we were just previously talking about? Maybe I can answer that. I'm not sure if you heard it. But um, generally, yes, but it's not like, a, it's not a like drop in whatever. Like it will require like some kind of new way of, yeah, writing your, like, yeah. There, there, for, for like synchronous compo uh, composability, you, you will need to, like there will, it will require changes in your parachain or whatever to still pop it. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't see it happening um, directly because the current Cumulus sort of parachains API doesn't provide any way of doing this. Um, what it will unlock will be things like uh, uh, Accords or Spree, um, which is essentially um, smart contracts that govern inter parachain behavior. Um, and one of the most obvious ones would be a tokens. Accord, which basically makes sure that parachains don't accidentally or otherwise mint more tokens than they're meant to, um, and therefore can share uh, tokens without uh, having to go via some uh, native chain or, or, or asset hub or whatever. And can sort of um, we can sort of ensure that uh, 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 bilateral agreements are, are held. Now, one of the other uh, ways of uh, that the sort of accords can really help is XCM. At the moment, any uh, multi-party XCM uh, uh, sort of transaction. So basically, think of an XCM transaction where you're going to use more than two chains. Maybe because um, you need to uh, uh, pay in one currency, which sits on one chain, uh, but the transaction will actually use an NFT, which sits on on some other chain, and uh, you've got your your sort of sender or your source and your destination chain are are also uh, different. Um, this is a <laughs> this is very difficult to use 
uh, XCM4 at present because it's just a chains don't trust each other, basically. Um, they trust that they will be held to their own code, but they can't trust that their code won't ultimately uh, do something different to what is expected because the chains are self-sovereign. What we need is a way for chains to kind of um, buy into some uh, multilateral uh, agreement. Uh, a little bit like uh, real world countries buy into some uh, criminal justice system like the International um, uh, uh, Court of Justice. Um, this, uh, this ensures that uh, because there is a common uh, 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 sort of law between, that's, that's actually a, unfortunately a loaded term, but because there is a, this, this shared law between the different uh, parachains, uh, they can interact in some um, some very uh, 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 meaningful way without having to have third parties involved. Um, synchronous composability is is like the basic idea of a blockchain is essentially that it runs in isolation, um, where it interacts with with other things. Uh, other chains, other systems, um, it kind of sends and receives messages which are naturally asynchronous. So it's kind of, um, it doesn't occur, at least at, at present, I don't see a way of easily marrying the idea of a, an isolated blockchain with synchronous composability. Maybe it will happen, and if it will happen, then I'm, I don't see why Jam would be a, a problematic platform on which to implement it. But I think at present we'll probably be looking for synchronous compose for scalable synchronous compos composability at um, architectures that are not uh, 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 blockchain based, owing to this kind of fundamental design limitation with them. Okay. Cool. Um, that makes sense. And I, and I think the way, uh, like, I think one of the really amazing things of the, of the way that Polkadot was architected back in the day was, like, the switch from auctions to core time, uh, you know, was, was a lot of work, but it was possible with uh, a lot of the kind of, like, base uh, technology that, that you and the team created very early on, right? And so I... I can kind of see that Jam is, in a way, also setting you know setting up like the Polkadot ecosystem for the next you know five ten years as well with you know many other changes and some of these things that you kind of mentioned. So um, yeah, it's very very interesting to see. Um, I was kind of wondering like where roughly we are in the development cycle. I know like it's been spoken about that our Jam is still some time away and that there's quite a few different um, steps to kind of go through, but yeah, would be kind of interested to hear, like the I guess the kind of the roadmap for rolling it out, um, and kind of how you're thinking about going uh, to develop it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I mean, we've been uh, prototyping and uh, and specifying uh, Jam now for. Uh, I mean, it's it's. I guess it's coming up to a year. Um, yeah, it must be almost a year now. So uh, work has been underway for some time. And we, we, we're at a point now where we have, I mean, with a grey paper um, release, we have something actually quite reasonably robust uh, that could, I think, probably one or two ambiguities in there, but could more or less be implemented um, by a sort of external team. Um, I, I think... If pushed, I would try to target the, a similar timeline to uh, that of the uh, of Ethereum One, uh, which is basically uh, you know the yellow paper was was um, launched, uh, uh, published uh, ten years more or less to the day um, uh, before the grey paper, and I would kind of hope for some kind of launch of Jam to be you know roughly following the same. Uh, timeline as, a, as as the launch of Ethereum one after the yellow paper, so maybe around a little over a year, maybe like fifteen months or so. Um, we'll see. I mean, you know, we can we can track this quite easily. Um, we know that, for example, um, if the Ethereum protocol, what well, Ethereum one protocol went into uh, being formally audited, um, I think around January twenty fifteen. So. We'd look to see if the, the the Jam protocol is being audited January twenty twenty five to see if it's if it's on schedule. Um, 
and uh, and you know there were a number of I think there were in total nine different uh, revisions of the uh, of the yellow paper. So we kind of want to see something along those lines, different revisions of the grey paper, as we as we get to um, as we get to you know whenever May uh, 2025, and and hopefully prepare for some uh, for, for for a launch. Um, this is pretty you know I mean it's at the end of the day, Jam is a relatively uh, cutting edge tech, I mean, really cutting edge tech, um, and I think you know it's 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 speculation. But um, yeah. all I can say is that it kind of worked reasonably well when we were when we were formal spec um, uh, uh, driven, when we were scope constrained. Um, it worked roughly. It worked to this time scale uh, back ten years ago. So you know, fingers crossed. Let's see if we can work to the same time scale now. Nice. And I think one of the differences uh, for Jam is that there will be different teams like implementing different clients, right? So the spec will really get um, tested, you could say. Absolutely. And this is one of the key sort of features, so to speak, with Jam. Um, as I said, with, uh, uh, with Polkadot uh, 1, it was very much implementation um, led. I mean, there is a a sort of specification on the Web3 uh, Foundation's website, but uh, I, I think it, 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 it's not, uh, it, it certainly didn't come first, right? Um, the implementation came first. And uh, with Jam, really what, we're, what we want to um, uh, uh, achieve is having uh, multiple implementations um, actually at day one of, of, of launch. So rather than just having one implementation made by parity <laughs> and basically one implementation team that knows the protocol inside out, um, actually have uh, many teams that know the protocol inside out um, and obviously not all, <laughs> not all in parity. Um, could, could you maybe comment as to like what that actually, uh, I guess, brings for the, the users of the jam chain? Like does that bring additional security or um, like ways of finding out you know, like bugs or um, like quality assurance would be kind of like uh, interesting to hear a little bit more about like why that's important. Um, well, basically, uh, it's resilience, right? It's it's why we're in this space in the first place. Um, like we 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 deliver uh, trustlessness. Uh, and resilience against arbitrary authority, arbitrary external authority, not in line with the, the established rules um, through decentralization, through actually cryptography as well, mathematics, um, through our understanding of, of economics and game theory, uh, but also through one of the sort of key aspects of this is through decentralization. Now, having a single developer team <laughs> is highly centralizing. Having a single implementation is highly centralizing. Um, so resilience, um, both in terms of having multiple implementations, multiple technical implementations, and therefore a bug unlikely to um, be in all of them. Um, and this, if you want evidence of this uh, giving resilience, you don't need to look very much further than the, the Shanghai attack on, uh, on Ethereum uh, back in, I think, 2016, when um, a, an issue with uh, Geth client resulted in uh, half of the network going down, but only half. Um, Ethereum itself uh, continued um, largely uh, unabated uh, due to uh, uh, Parity client not having that book. Um, now, the uh, it's also this resilience is also delivered not just through technical uh, um, uh, um, decentralization, but through uh, intellectual decentralization. At the moment. Um, People that are familiar with, like, deeply familiar with the Polkadot protocol, like, specifically how uh, real uh, the real implementations work, are almost entirely um, employees of Parity or the Web3 Foundation. Um, and indeed, unfortunately, for some elements of the, of the protocol, um, the implementation differs um, uh, from what the uh, the, the researchers had established, um, not in problematic ways, but nonetheless, uh, it makes uh, it, it devalues that expertise. 
Um, so what uh, what Jam aims to do is to set the record straight um, and to have uh, not merely uh, uh, or not only a, uh, a technical decentralization, many different implementations, but also intellectual decentralization. So there are many, many different people um, under many different sort of uh, uh, economic umbrellas um, that are uh, uh, experts in the protocol. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and so maybe maybe this is kind of a good segue to talk about the tour that you were doing. Um, would you would you care to tell us a little bit more about that and how it kind of um, plays into this? I guess like you know peer review process and um, yeah intellectual decentralization. Sure. Um, well, I mean it's. Uh... <laughs> I don't know if you've if you've uh, had a chance to flick through the grey paper. It's not a um, it's not exactly light reading, um, and even if you're reasonably familiar with uh, with you know blockchain concepts, with um, economics and game theory, with with formal um, uh, formal maths, it's still a bit um, terse. Um, so the purpose of the tour is for those who are interested. Um, is to, to try really try and explain every single equation in the grey paper, uh, why it's there, the reasoning behind it, um, and the impl implement, uh, implications of it. Um, now, I don't think everyone who will ever want to understand the grey paper will be able to make it to these uh, 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 lectures, and also I don't plan on going in-depth into the whole paper in every lecture, I'm, um, I mean, the paper is just too um, substantial uh, to do that. So rather, each lecture will have a sort of right to middling uh, uh, sort of overview. Um, and then on top of that, I'll do a deeper dive into um, one, of the, uh, one of the sections. And the idea is that we collect all of, we video it all, and we collect it all together, and, um, and ultimately edit it into um, a, a sort of uh, reasonably good education uh, uh, video that you know, people can watch and, and sort of understand or hopefully help understand the uh, um, how to interpret the great paper. Nice. It sounds like we need a new uh, a new behind the code uh, version for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, so, like, where are you planning to go with the tour? Like, uh, you mentioned kind of, I think, universities. Um, like, how many, how many universities you're looking to attend and what kind of session sizes are you looking at filling? Um, I mean, the primary goal here is to get the educational um, video. So the, um, the audience sizes are not so... Uh, so important, I would think between 20 and 200 um, as a rough order of magnitude in terms of audience size. Um, and yeah, indeed, it will be, I think, exclusively at universities. Um, and it's it's a global tour. Uh, there'll be probably a few more in, uh, in Asia and Europe than in the Americas, but um, I'm actually beginning in the Americas. I'm in Buenos Aires right now. Um, ready to start the first lecture tomorrow, and I'll um, I'll proceed to Stanford um, uh, uh, for next week for a lecture there uh, before uh, doing a few in Europe, um, and it will be over. I think I'm, the idea is to do maybe five or six, maybe a few more um, over the next say five six weeks, and then have one or two more. Um, Close, like more like end of summer, early autumn, um, when uh, term time begins again, uh, and also when the grey paper hopefully is now it will be at a point of more or less um, completion. Um, there's actually one particular um, thing, one particular facility that needs to be properly um, uh, specified and uh, test implementation done. Um, which I think is is essentially the last major change that will be to the to the Jam uh, protocol proposal, um, and that's uh, that should be um, done by uh, by the time that we do these last uh, two or three lectures, and so uh, that should dovetail quite nicely. 
Okay. Uh, I noticed the uh, J uh, sorry the Grey Paper website doesn't have the tour dates up yet. Is there anywhere else that people could go to um, look at their locations? I assume many people listening would like to come and attend. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, so the the I know the local areas are advertising, um, but yeah, indeed, they should, we should definitely get them up on the website. I think they've only been finalised for a few days. Um, the website is the place to go, and as the dates are finalised, dates and locations are finalised, um, they'll be they'll be put on there. Okay, nice. Are you going to print any like a uh, tour T-shirts? You know, bands always doing tour movement bits <laughs> on the back. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a very good idea. Should, def should definitely uh, get one. I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah. We've we've actually got some some T-shirts in the making. Um, and I've been involved quite heavily in the design, nice. but, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, there was some, you know, they were meant to be delivered to Dubai and then there was this like uh, <laughs> massive downpour there and all the logistics yes, yes. completely screwed yes. up. So, uh, they're, they're unfortunately a bit delayed, but yeah, hopefully we'll, um, we'll have some nice t-shirts and they're not too distant people. Okay. Nice. Sign, sign me up for the, the tour one with all the dates on the back. That's good. Um, I would like to, uh, I know we're kind of getting a little bit close for time, but I think one of the, the, the most interesting parts of jam from my point of view is like the services. Um, and we'd love to touch on that a little bit more. Um, so, so you kind of mentioned like the. Polkadot parachain concept as we have today is basically going to be one of many potential services. What are some of the others that you can see uh, coming to fruition? And and like, what are some of the potential use cases from some of these services that, that, that you can kind of think of already? Okay, um, I'm I got I got to tell you, I'm not going to think too deeply about about this quite yet. Um, I do have one or two in mind. Uh, what, I'll give you one example. Um, a kind of ZK uh, snark service um, where um, there's actually a fairly minimal amount of compute to do, uh, but quite a lot of um, uh, uh, quite a lot of storage. Um, so we can imagine that a ZK snark service could be paired quite nicely with a compute intense but storage light um, service, and they could basically share. Um, one core at a time. Um, the uh, we might imagine a storage service, um, so something along the lines of uh, kind of Filecoin or whatever that offered proofs for um, uh, for data for the storage of data. Um, in in essence, what we're going to be looking at are, are things that. Um, I don't want to say that they're, they're, they're going to be things that we that we would normally use a computer for, right? Um, and therefore, there isn't really any particular pattern that we need to look for as to why something would make a good service. The idea is that a service is, uh, is, is it's kind of like saying what, what makes a good smart contract. I mean, well, basically, um, basically anything that you can use a computer for. The issue is, of course, with smart contracts that you've been in systems up until now is that you're heavily limited in what you can do with them simply through the, the gas or, or whatever it is that's, um, that means your, your smart contract has, has to execute uh, and finish within, um, within a block. Um, now, one of the things that the jam services allow for that perhaps um, isn't so uh, isn't so constrained that is less constraining than you would find in a smart contract system is that you can spin up virtual machines. Now you can spin up um, what's what we call PVM, polka dot polka virtual machine. Um, this is a uh, it, it's a it's a slight riff on a uh, on a risk. Five uh, machine risk five if you're not familiar is this kind of open source um, hardware spec um, sp strictly speaking it's an open source instruction set architecture um, and basically the PVM is a bit like it, it, it it's it's more it's translatable from um, risk five so if you can if your compiler can output risk five 
a machine code, then it can it can be trivially translated into PVM machine code. Um, and what you can do inside of Jam is that you can create a PVM instance um, and just run that uh, run that uh, instance as long as you want. And then when it's when it's when you're done, when you don't want to run it anymore. Um, you can you can tell it sort of how many steps to take, a bit like gas, and it can halt. But then the cool thing is that you can um, uh, you can save it, you can save its state, and then restore it at some later stage. Now, what this means is um, that one can imagine services that have long running processes, right? And this isn't so easy to do on a smart contract system. Um, largely because firstly you don't have access to a in, instanceable uh, instanceable virtual machine and secondly because the gas costs are so huge and the gas costs are much 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 um, 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 smaller in jam simply because jam is way more efficient and has way more um, parallelism um, and it has this facility uh, sort of built in and that gives you uh, I think really quite a lot more uh, possibility for what kind of software you can host, what kind of programming paradigms you can utilize. Does that mean we're going to be able to play games directly on Jam? I mean, the idea is indeed that you would be able to basically take a random piece of software, um, compile it to RISC-V, which you know is easy, and then uh, just run it on the chain. And it, it, it will just, it will kind of just run. Like there isn't really a, there is no step three you know, <laughs> uh, from the old uh, uh, Mac adverts. It's like, it, it will just work. Um, there's no real need to think deeply about, you know, block space or gas or, or, or solidity stuff or security or blah, blah. It, 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 just, it just runs. It just works. And this is really what we're, what we're aiming for. This is like the North Star. Mm. We want to make uh, building for blockchain, building for Jam specifically, um, as easy as just building. <laughs> you know? No, right. So, so basically what you're saying is any code that you can compile down to RISC-V could then run on chain with, with, with the yeah, long the processes and, and like uh, persistent storage and that kind of thing. Indeed. And when we say any code uh, that can be compiled to RISC-V, I mean, that's basically any code since uh, LLVM can target RISC-V. So, yeah, right. Um, Okay. Yeah, I mean that, that sounds super, super interesting. <laughs> it sounds, sounds like a, a massive game changer, right? Like, um, yeah, that's super cool. Um, okay, nice. Hey, uh, I think that we are getting close-ish to time. I do have a couple more questions I would like to ask, but um, if there is anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question, uh, please feel free to write it in like a reply to the space. Um, if you're on mobile, uh, there should be a little button in the bottom right. Uh, like for me, it is blue with a little feather. You can tap on that and uh, send a reply to the space. Um, and then we can, we'll ask a couple questions at the end. Um, so uh, I, gu I guess like one of the things that's not overly um, specified and, and maybe on purpose was around like the um, like token for the chain or for, for jam. Will it, will it, and you know, maybe this is on purpose, but will it continue to use dot or some other, some other token potentially? No, I mean, uh, the idea is that it, it uses dot. <laughs> um, I mean, the idea is, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a replacement for the relay chain uh, with everything that that uh, entails. So as the relay chain was the native chain for the dot token, uh, then this token dot jam chain will become the native chain for the dot, dot token. Um, now, this is, the, this is the proposal. This is what's been um, placed in the polka dot governance. Um, and uh, last I checked, it was it was uh, going going through reasonably uh, 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 with a good amount of support. Um, so uh, I don't know. Is that still the case? Is it, does anyone anyone know? Uh, I think I looked at it last night, and it was still uh, in favour. Yes. <laughs> um, um, so, like, the idea is that uh, if indeed Jam is sort of ratified as being. Um, the uh, the replacement for the relay chain, then yes, uh, it would. It, in terms of the dot token, it would just basically be hosted by the jam chain instead of the polka dot jam chain instead of the polka dot relay chain. Um, and no, 
there are no specific economic changes that need to be included um, as per the JAM protocol. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we don't utilize the, uh, um, you know, this sort of major step change um, uh, upgrade as a, uh, as a sort of jumping off point in order to um, alter uh, the dot economics, but that's a separate conversation. It doesn't need to be um, uh, done, you know, with, with JAM in mind. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Um, and so I guess, like, would you say, uh, would you say Jam is the next iteration of, of kind of Polkadot and the Polkadot ecosystem? Or, I mean, the more I hear, it more sounds like it's a, it's kind of a separate thing altogether, which kind of encompasses Polkadot as part of it. Um, I mean, it's, it's a technology bed, right? So it's, uh, I think it's, I, I, I think it has the potential to really redefine um, Polkadot, which, are, which somewhat accidentally has become this very much, um, you know, power chains focus, app chain even focused um, uh, uh, platform into something that's um, that's less focused around specifically app chains and more just about applications. Um, so yeah, I think it has the potential to redefine what Polkadot means to many people. But if we if we look at the original sort of vision, it was Polkadot was still about delivering the world computer. It's just that there was a bit of a, a bit of accidental opinionation in how that should be delivered. That uh, Jam winds back somewhat. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah that, that totally makes sense. Um, and there's also a prize, right, for uh, like a. a allotment of dot allocated for people that want to um, create their own client or implementation is that correct if you could tell us a little bit more would be yeah. interesting certainly yeah so we've we've allocated 10 million uh, dot uh, that's that's uh, backstopped by the foundation um, and uh, it's, it is indeed there for um, um, yeah, for client implementers um, Specifically, how that is going to be um, sort of doled out uh, is is yet to be um, sort of confirmed. It's still something that, that I'm kind of thinking over. Um, but broadly speaking, I see I see sort of separate pots for um, for separate language uh, programming language families um, in order to try to get several different kinds of. Of, uh, of, of programming languages utilized for um, the implementation, uh, for the implementations. I mean, Ethereum back in the day had like a Java implementation, C++, a Go implementation, a Python implementation, a Haskell implementation. These are, I mean, some of them are more similar than others, of course, but um, um, these are uh, fairly different languages, you know, Haskell versus Rust versus C++ each are, fit into the different uh, versus Python, each, but each uh, fit into different kind of language families. And I would want to try and incentivize something similar for Jam. Um, and then I think the other thing that I would look for is uh, to try to get uh, a good um, sort of on ramp um, into this. So maybe you don't have to deliver a, uh, a, a Jam implementation that can um, validate on on you know the most uh, polka dot, which we, which I would expect to be the most um, uh, performance um, uh, cr critical um, uh, uh, blockchain network. Um, maybe if you can just uh, deliver something that can correctly import blocks, um, you you can get you know you get some funding for that. You get some uh, you get some prize for that. Um, and with the idea behind this is essentially that um, we don't want to set the sort of barrier to entry to be so high that um, it's only sort of really established um, software consultancies that could possibly um, uh, get any uh, any fun, any prize from it. Uh, but also um, we want to get you know, the bedroom coder, the hacker, someone who's just going to do it in their spare time for six months, this kind of um, individual or small team uh, we really want to, to get get involved okay awesome and uh where's the best place for people to go if they want to apply or kind of learn more about this uh prize um the gray paper website graypaper.org um is uh, uh will have relevant details when they're when they're announced which i would hope is going to be um in the next uh, month 
and uh, also the Web3 Foundation. I'm sure we'll, we'll place it on its, uh, on its website in a prominent location as well. Nice, love those guys. Um, we have a few questions from the audience that I'll go through. Um, uh, from Alison Bob, uh, he has said, does Jam mark a new step beyond third generation blockchains? Maybe fourth generation? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm a little bit... Um... What, what, what's third generation? I mean, is Polkadot third generation? I think, uh, yeah. So I, I, my understanding would be like a Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot being first, second, third. Okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I would, I would say that, um, uh, that Jam, uh, Jam, I mean, almost by definition as it's a, uh, as it's sort of a, 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 the one after Polkadot would, would surely constitute a fourth generation of design. But, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I wasn't even really particular familiar, particularly familiar with the first, second, and third generation. So I don't know who, which, uh, which sort of, um, what the organisation of individuals are that that that, uh, that decide that can dictate this. But I think it's crypt, crypto Twitter. I would, I, I would have thought. Crypto yeah, Twitter. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, you know, I mean, it's it seems to me that yes, this would. Uh, this could very easily constitute a fourth generation of design. Certainly, um, in my design thinking, it's it's fourth generation. Mm. It does definitely sound uh, very different from what we have to date, I think, in the blockchain space. Um, someone, Bizarre Crypto, wrote, could Jam, or could, or could Jam be compared to a sort of computational power cloud, maybe like the AWS of blockchains? Yeah, um, it, it can perhaps. Now, the the big big problem with comparing it to the cloud is that the cloud is not held in consensus. Um, mm. So, one of the one of the, one of the blockchain things that I think is most uh, comparable to sort of AWS to this kind of cloud compute resource um, is uh, Gollum. I don't know if if you if you remember this project, it was um, it was started. It was like one of the early Ethereum. Uh, ICOs um, started by uh, a few of the guys from Poland that had uh, actually contributed to Ethereum um, uh, to the Ethereum C++ client I think back in the day um, and it was really designed to be a uh, basically AWS on on chain on the on the blockchain powered by the blockchain um, now of course the computation didn't happen on chain uh, the computation happened on random people's computers um, but the the, the sort of magic of Gollum was that um, it, it was sort of checked um, and there was some game theoretic basis for believing that the computation would be done correctly. Now, that that was obviously, uh, that, that, that basis wasn't going to be as strong as actually doing it on the chain because on the chain you get sort of the whole power of the Ethereum validating community to check everything works, uh, is done correctly. Um, but... It's uh, uh, probably the bigger difference was that it wasn't held in consensus, which basically means there isn't a single um, point of truth where you can keep your state and be sure that everything kind of eventually gets folded in. Um, it, it, it was really just a, a piece and a sort of isolated piece of computation that was done and that could be done. And it's the same with AWS. Right? It's like you, you fire up an AWS machine, you upload some data to it, you do some computation, and eventually uh, the AWS machine instance spins down. You can take whatever data you want off it, but when you spin a new AWS instance up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be blank again. You're going to have to upload the data again. Um, there isn't like a, an AWS, I don't know, uh, uh, JavaScript object environment where you can just sort of stick the data and it, it, it exists in persistence in quite the same way that Ethereum um, has its persistent state and Polkadot has its persistent relay chain. Um, so I, I, I hesitate to say it's like AWS because uh, it, it's actually quite a lot. It provides a specific facility, material facility that AWS does not provide uh, beyond the trustlessness. Um, in some sense, it, I mean, really, it's it's a bit like what you expect from a uh, you know from a smart contract system 
Um, the main difference is that um, when you interact with, with these on-chain services, that are a little bit like smart contracts, is that uh, it goes through a, a sort of extremely high performance um, transactional preprocessor, the transaction preprocessor. Basically, the data that c is coming in from the external world um, goes through a, a huge amount of, uh, of, of arbitrary, permissionless, Turing complete computation uh, before it even gets uh, to the point where it, 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 it gets folded into this kind of main data, this main database, this main state. In addition to that, and um, this is the sort of facility that we're adding now, and this is the, actually something I find really cool, is that um, data from different times um, can make its way um, into and out of um, this, uh, this pre-processing stage. So rather than sort of going into, uh, having to go into the middle or having to be kept on some sort of layer two, um, data can kind of float in uh, distributed availability of JAM and it can make it, it, can, it, it, it sort of doesn't, it doesn't uh, need to be um, sent off to some distributed storage solution, nor does it need to actually make its way on chain. It can just sort of, hang there ready for usage um, and you know not indefinitely there's a 28 day limit that's what we're targeting at the moment but nonetheless for most applications this 28 day limit is is easily enough and so we end up with this really uh, um, interesting uh, uh, very powerful um, architecture that isn't just about processing lots of data in the same way that sort of aws is yeah yeah totally okay so, yeah so it sounds like there's it's uh, yeah. There's there's a lot more you can do with it than just compute, basically. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. Cool. I think that is it from questions from the audience. Unless uh, unless there's anything you wanted to close with, Gavin, I think we could wrap up. Uh, no, I think I think we've we've covered a decent amount. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you and the team coming on. Um, really nice to have you on a Twitter space and hopefully we can have you back soon. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. I know it, uh, it's getting a little bit later here in Europe and I know it's uh, early morning for, for everyone in the US. So thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention. Uh, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to send them on the space and um, we can look to answer them either in a uh, blog post or maybe, uh, maybe I can reply to you on Twitter. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, if you also, the other thing that I think could be quite interesting, if you wanted to go into more detail um, about Jam, there's a really good interview on the Kusamarian uh, that Gavin did. I think I think you filmed in Dubai, right? Just after the release of the Grey Paper. Um, yeah, it's just before the release. Just yeah. before, yeah. There's a really good in interview there. If you look at the Kusamarian, either on um, Twitter or YouTube, um, there's, I think it's like an hour and a half. It's it's quite long, but very in depth, which is uh, which is really nice. So um, I would definitely go and check that out as a next step if you wanted to find out um, more information or go deeper. Uh, and the grey paper is available um, on the grey paper website as well as the information about the tour and a form for the prize that was mentioned as well, the ten million dot. Um, that's it from me. Thanks everyone again for coming, and thanks for your time, everyone.